We're going to turn to John chapter 20, and we are reading from verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked and Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Thank you, Bev. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see those who are joining us online. There's a number of people who are joining us online today. Welcome. Uh, please keep that Bible reading open in front of you. Uh, we're going to spend some time looking at that. Um, but before we do, allow me to pray. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for once again the opportunity that we have, Lord, to sit under your word. Lord, we recognize the words we've just read are your word, the words inspired by you. And so, Father, we pray and commit that we will humble ourselves uh, before your word. And the words that I speak, Father, may you use it for your purposes this morning. And may your Holy Spirit be at work in and every one of our hearts this morning, uh, again, for your glory. Amen. Amen. I wonder how many of us here are masters of Rubric Cube? Has anybody done it? No? No one? No one? Wow. Okay. No, I can't see any hands. Well, um, until a few years ago, I like you. I, I have tried. I, have, I, have, I could not understand how this works. And I have been a very um, hard skeptic of solving the Rubric Cube. Um, as I said, I don't understand how it works. I've tried hours and hours to kind of work it out, and it has been impossible. Um, I've, I've doubted even the TV shows, right? You see these people doing it under one minute, right? And I'm like, how do you do that? And then there was this one video that I saw, this guy underwater doing it under one minute, not just one, but three cubes underwater without breathing. I'm like, that's impossible. That's insane. Um, so, but until a few years ago, I was very skeptical. But then uh, there was this kid at our kids' club who came and he had a Rubik's Cube and, and he did it less than three minutes. I'm like, wow, man, you are good. Like, now I believe. Yeah, well, this can be done. He did something like this to this. Well, I mean, that's just amazing, isn't it? The skill. And so um, I had this personal encounter with the kid who could solve the rubric cube. And now I believe. So well, last couple of weeks, we have been looking at the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus who died on Good Friday came back to life on Easter Sunday. And the first disciples not only saw the resurrection, uh, uh, the, the empty tomb, the empty grave clothes. No, they had a personal encounter with the risen Lord Jesus, didn't they? And they believed. And they believed. But in the passage that we read today, we meet Thomas. 
who wasn't there when Jesus appeared to his friends in that house on the resurrection Sunday. And when he joined them, I don't know when, but when he joined them, everyone started telling, we have seen the Lord. Thomas, you missed him. And Thomas, he doubted. He doubted, didn't he? We hear him say in verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. I will not believe it. What was he looking for? He was looking for a personal encounter with the risen Lord Jesus, wasn't he? And perhaps some of you can, can relate to that. A couple of weeks ago uh, at the Christianity Explored course, we looked at the resurrection of Jesus. And, and one of the questions at the end of the video is, so what do you think about the resurrection? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? And one person said, well, I can see it is true. I, I, I can see the evidence, but how can I believe? How can I believe? So how, uh, how do I, living in 2022, believe in the resurrection of Jesus, which happened 2,000 years ago? That's the question we are looking at this morning. So let's meet Thomas, the doubter. Thomas, the doubter. Why did he doubt? Why did he find it so hard to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? No, we are not told exactly why he doubted. But there are some clues to kind of uh, figure out what must have been happening in Thomas's mind. Perhaps it was a recent failure that he struggled with. We all know Thomas was one of the uh, loyal friends of Jesus. In John chapter 11, when, uh, when Jesus was going to raise Lazarus back to life, he had to go to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, all the Jews were waiting to kill Jesus. And, and the disciples said, well, Jesus, don't go. And, and he said, no, I must go. I must go to Jerusalem. And what does Thomas say? He says, well, okay, let's go. Let's get killed with Jesus. Let's die with him. In Matthew chapter 26, with the rest of the disciples, Thomas, too, said, right, we will never abandon you. I will never deny you. But we know what happened at the garden, don't we? Everyone abandoned Jesus, including Thomas. Thomas couldn't keep his word to Jesus. He failed Jesus. Perhaps that caused him doubt. Maybe that's something causing doubt in your mind this morning. A recent failure, a, a moral failure, sin, failing Jesus, and you feel guilty, you feel ashamed, and you, don't, you doubt yourself to trust in Jesus, to take that step of faith. Perhaps doubt is stemming from lack of understanding. You see, even after seeing the empty tomb, the empty grave clothes we, we saw last week, the disciples didn't really understand from the Bible that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So one of the first things that Jesus had to do when he appeared to the disciples was to actually go and explain things. He did this with the two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus explained to them what was said about him in all scripture. And he did the same with all the disciples, didn't he? Then he, he opened the minds so that they could understand the scripture. Perhaps the reason, reason why you don't or you, hard, you find it hard to believe this morning, is that you don't really understand how this all works. It, it's too much. It is, it is overwhelming. And perhaps it was because of a false expectation or disappointment that Thomas doubted. 
Here in verse 25, if you have a look at your Bibles, you will see that Thomas is fixated on the wounds of Jesus. He couldn't forget how Jesus was flogged over and over again, how he was mocked by the soldiers, how, how the nails were kind of drilled into his, his hands and, and how he was pierced on, on his side, how Jesus died and how he was wrapped and put it in a tomb. Like the rest of the disciples, Thomas expected Jesus to be this powerful Messiah king who would overthrow the Roman Empire and, and who would set up the kingdom of God right then and there. But then this Jesus is dead. He saw him die. All his expectations were, were dashed. And how could, I, how could I believe in Jesus anymore? He failed us. Perhaps that's what is causing you doubt your expectations are dashed and you're disappointed with Jesus because the prayers, your prayers weren't answered the way you wanted to. And there's too much suffering around us. The war in Ukraine, the floods, the bushfires, the, the economic crisis in Sri Lanka, it's, isn't Jesus supposed to make everything good? Isn't he supposed to make everything better? You, you, you doubt the power of Jesus. You doubt his existence. You doubt his, his very existence, don't you? Perhaps Thomas was doubting because he was isolating from other believers. His isolation kind of, kind of pushed him into doubt. We don't know exactly why Thomas was absent on that first Sunday when Jesus appeared to the rest. It could be that he was too sad and he just, the last thing he wanted to do was to be with his friends. So he, he goes away perhaps, all on his own, to, to wallow and, and kind of mull over what just happened. Perhaps he might have even gone to his, his other friends who didn't really approve Jesus. And this is another way our doubts grow, isn't it? We don't talk to anyone. We, we deal with our doubts on our own, or we go and talk to the wrong people. Perhaps that's why Thomas doubted the resurrection of Jesus. I wonder this morning, what is causing you doubt? Is it a recent failure? Is it a lack of understanding? Is it a false expectation? Has Jesus failed you? Is it because you have been isolating yourself from other believers? So what happened to Thomas? What happened to Thomas? How did he become a believer? In verses 26 to 29, he had an encounter with Jesus, didn't he? He had an encounter with Jesus. After a week, Thomas was with his friends again, and, and again we are told that the doors were closed, locked in the place where they were meeting, and John says, Jesus came. He walked, and he stood there, and he spoke, peace be with you. If you were here last week, we, we talked about that this was, this was more than a greeting of peace. This was this, this offer of peace that Jesus has now purchased for us because of his death on the cross. And then Jesus not only shows himself to Thomas, shows his wounds, he graciously invites Thomas to touch him, feel his wounds. And then he lovingly calls Thomas, Thomas, stop doubting. Start believing. Be believing. Do you see how gracious Jesus is with Thomas? 
He didn't have to come to Thomas, right? And Thomas was a bit arrogant. He didn't want to believe the, 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 the friends when, when they said, we have seen the Lord. And then Jesus could have just zapped him then and there because he had so much power. Or he could have just ignored Thomas, right? He could have said, well, Thomas is just one person, right? I had appeared to the 10 and there were women who believed. They all believed in me, so let's ignore Thomas. Let's ignore Thomas. He doesn't need to know. I mean, he will come around one day. But he didn't. He comes specifically for Thomas. And he does exactly what Thomas demanded, right, earlier? See the nail marks in my hands? Put your finger where the nails were and put your hand into my side? Why? Why would Jesus go into such extent? Because friends, we know Jesus is the good shepherd, isn't he? He is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 behind and goes after the lost sheep. He loved Thomas. And he doesn't want him to be lost. He doesn't want him to go on in his misery forever and ever and, and to be lost. He wants Thomas to get it. He wants Thomas to believe and this is the same Jesus that we believe, don't we? He comes after us. He, he pursues us. He does everything in his power to, power to help us to see him. He calls the doubters to stop doubting, but be believing because he doesn't want us to be lost. In, in verse 28, if you have your Bibles, we, we see that this amazing confession. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God, when he sees Jesus. No, this was not an not a ex exclamation saying, oh, my Lord, what have I seen today? No, he was not saying that. It was a statement of faith, a confession. Here from the, from the greatest doubter comes the greatest confession. My Lord, my God. When Thomas encountered the risen Lord Jesus, what did he encounter? He encountered his Lord. He encountered his God. He had an encounter with God himself. How did Thomas the doubter become a believer? He, he had a personal encounter with the risen Lord Jesus, the God and the Lord of the universe. And he believed. He put his faith in Jesus. Now it is interesting, it is very interesting the word for faith or believe in the whole of John's gospel, uh, he, doesn't use the word, he doesn't use the noun. He uses the Greek verb to describe faith. In other words, he, he, John's not concerned about the content of our faith. He's highlighting the act of believing. Trusting in Jesus is not something we have. It is something we do. Faith works. Faith is active. So we hear in, John, in, in, in the letter, to, uh, letter that James wrote, uh, one of Jesus' half-brothers, he writes, faith without deeds is dead. Faith without deeds is dead. Our faith needs to be accompanied by actions. Thomas not only believed in the risen Lord Jesus, if we, if we look at the tradition, he was so convinced of Jesus, he ended up preaching the gospel back in South India. 
He became the first missionary to India who took the gospel to the unreached world. His faith was accompanied with action. What about us? How do we believe? Would we get to personally encounter Jesus? Verse 29, Jesus kind of indicates what he, what he wants from us. He indicates that we will believe without seeing. Seeing him the way Thomas and the first disciples did. Jesus says, blessed are those who believe and yet who haven't seen. What does he mean by that? Yes, we will encounter Jesus. We will encounter Jesus. But no, it won't be the same way as Thomas did. We won't get to touch and feel the physical body of Jesus. So how will we encounter Jesus today? Verses 30 to 31, uh, and the last couple of verses. John tells us that this is the very purpose that he wrote the gospel. The, this is the very purpose that he wrote this gospel. These are written that you may believe in the Christ. You may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. What is he saying? He wrote down his own eyewitness account so that we may read, meditate, see, and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Later in, uh, in the first letter, uh, John, wrote, John writes these words. He says, we write to you about eternal God. He says, we write to you about the eternal God. Just imagine that. Whom we have heard from our own ears, whom we have seen with our own eyes, whom we have touched. Just try to get your head around that. He's saying, we've seen him, we've heard him, we've touched him, we proclaim him to you. We encounter Jesus, friends, in the Gospels through the written word. Now, I don't mean that today Jesus cannot appear in the same way that he appeared to Thomas. I mean, he, he would decide to do whatever he wants to because he is God. Now, there have been numerous occasions in the Bible that we see Jesus appearing to people. There were 500 people at once that Jesus appeared to. And, and we hear that Jesus appeared to, the Paul, uh, appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. And I have personally heard a couple of stories from people who have had visions of Jesus. Jesus appeared to them in, in dreams, and, and, this, and they have become believers. And this is very common uh, occurrence among the Muslim community, where Jesus appears to people in visions and dreams. He could do that. But the primary way that God reveals himself to us is through his written word. Here we get the most accurate, the most relevant, the most trustworthy picture of who Jesus is. Even if we have a vision of Jesus, even if we dream of Jesus, we must come back to the word of God and compare it with the word of God. I mean, isn't it amazing that God hasn't allowed us to have a God of our own imagination? Isn't that amazing? He has revealed himself in the word of God. We can know the real Jesus in his word. As we read, as we hear, as we meditate the word, as I said last week, the Holy Spirit begins to work in our hearts, convincing, helping us to see who Jesus is, giving us an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus so that we may believe. And as we do, John says, 
We have life in him. We have life in him. Not just life everlasting, not just a ticket to heaven. No, we have life now. A new life, a life with purpose, a life with joy, a life of forgiveness, a life of peace with God, a life of abundance. And that's what we have when we encounter Jesus and we believe in him. A few years ago, the reason why I didn't believe in the Rubik Cube was because I couldn't understand how this all works, and I still can't understand. I failed to solve it, and I still fail to solve it. I thought it was a lie until I had an encounter with a kid who solved it in front of my eyes. Now I believe it could be done. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, Perhaps that's where you are this morning. For whatever reason you doubt, you can't really come to terms with the resurrection of Jesus, who Jesus is, and you're not fully convinced. And this morning you are are invited to encounter him, the real him in the Bible. And by believing, he invites us to have life in him. And for those of us who have believed, it is important that we continue to encounter Jesus in the word of God so that we can continue to believe in him. We must study it on our own. We must study it in in groups. And it is important that we live out our faith, that faith becomes action in our lives, that it is not something that we did a long time ago that it is an ongoing action in our life, that we live by faith. And it is important that we preach the gospel and support the work of gospel here in Australia and beyond Australia. It is important that we pray for our non-believing friends and family that they have an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. It is important that we pray and support Organizations like Wycliffe Bible Translators or the Bible Society who do a lot of work in translating the Bible into the languages of the world. That people may encounter Jesus in his word and they believe. And that by believing in Jesus, they too may have life. And Jesus says, I have come to give life. Life to the full. And that's what, friends, we have when we encounter Jesus and we believe in him. We have life and life to the full. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we we give you great thanks Lord, that you have not kept us in the dark. Lord, your word, we are told, is a lamp unto our feet. And Father, we pray today as we delve into your word, help us to see Jesus. Help us to encounter Jesus because, Lord, you have revealed yourself the work of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the work of the Holy Spirit in in your word. So we pray this morning, Lord, help us to delve into your word. Forgive us for the times that we have not done so. Forgive us for the times that we have depended on the God, the Jesus of our imagination, and then we have got disappointed. Father, help us to believe in Jesus. And Father, may our our faith in Jesus be active. Help us to know how to put this faith into action in our everyday lives. 
So we thank you and praise you for this morning. We thank you that Jesus is risen and he is risen indeed. So we give you praise in his name. Amen.